So I've been playing Elden Ring on the gaming channel with my editor and lackey Dave recently. Yeah, that thumbnail's a work of art, I know. The comment section is right down there, tell me about it. And you know what? It's actually a pretty good game. The combat is exactly the way that a Souls-like game should be. Though to be honest, the summons make things a bit too easy sometimes. The dungeons you can find throughout the game feel exactly like an area in Dark Souls. The bosses all have that same feel, the lore, it's all just great. The addition of an open world feels a bit disjointed, I'm not gonna lie, but for what it is, it's done very well. Open worlds in games always feel empty, because, well, they are. The reason most open world games are set in a post-apocalypse is because it's an easy excuse to not fill the world out with people and stuff to do. Don't get me wrong, games like Fallout or Breath of the Wild have stuff to discover in their sandboxes, and those are great games, but generally open worlds, due to this emptiness, make the player feel like they're actually the last person on Earth, running around a depopulated landscape. Sometimes this fits the setting well, like with Fallout. Other times it goes against the conventions of the franchise, like Zelda. But with Elden Ring, it's a perfect pairing. Souls games, lore-wise, always have have this general idea that you're fucked. The entire world's fucked and you've got to fix it. The land has fallen into decay, the civilization is crumbling, and the few friendly creatures that are still left are just subsisting within its rotting corpse. The only hope is that you can rejuvenate the whole thing. It's not like Fallout where the land might be fucked but there's a lot of good healthy people still running around. It's not like a zombie setting where the people are fucked but infrastructure is still kind of intact at least at the start. In Souls games the story generally is that reality itself is fucked on some fundamental level. Everyone and every Everything is cursed, including yourself, but you need to march on if there's going to be any hope of fixing it. The open world of Elden Ring perfectly complements this feeling. The UI is sparse, no quest log, no mini-map, a compass of only limited usefulness. You're dropped into the world with a general idea of where to go, Stormvale Castle, and the most direct route, while nearby, is guarded by a punishingly hard boss, Margit the Fell. If you're good at the game, you can beat him right out the gate. But the game expects you to search the area. There are bosses right out in the open, like that mounted golden knight guy or the dragon you fight on horseback that drop a lot of experience, as well as unique powerful items. There are also many dungeons to discover and explore, not marked on the map, containing treasure and the opportunity to get stronger. In other words, the game doesn't hold your hand. It gives you a goal that you probably can't accomplish, a world full of things to discover that will incrementally move you closer towards that goal, and then says, have at it. That type of game design really helps hammer home the everything and everyone is fucked feeling from this genre of game. So is anybody surprised that the NPCs who make up Western game development raged at Elden Ring's success and at the gamers who enjoy it? Here's a public conversation on Twitter between several developers. One of them is an Ubisoft dev, another is a programmer, and the third one is from Guerrilla Games, the people who made Horizon Zero Dawn. The fact that Elden Ring scored a 97 on Metacritic is proof that reviewers don't give a flaming poop about game user experience. Nor PC graphics stability and performance, apparently. Nor quest design, really. This exchange went viral because it showed just how out of touch these people are with what gamers actually want. Somebody made this mock-up of what these people think a good user experience is. And this looks exactly like the trash these people put out. The screen is cluttered with shit, constant pop-ups and alerts of nearby objectives or quests. Button prompts are everywhere, the character uselessly narrating to nobody, and of course, microtransactions. This was the kind of thing we memed about on V over a decade ago. No, really, this was the meme. The guy from Gorilla ended up locking his account over the whole thing, because he really showed his ass in this conversation. Worse than when he made Alloy look like Nakado Avocado. The original poster, meanwhile, also stated that the user experience is generally awful. Nothing feels intentional or playtested. What an awful take. Before joining Ubisoft, this guy actually worked on the UI for Battlefield 2042, a game made by EA. And look at this hideous garbage. Can you tell if these settings in the menu are on or off? The color inverts when you move your cursor off the selection. So it seems like it should have been on, but it's actually off when you move it away. If you have to like, select it and then move away and stare at it a bit and then test it in the game, you have failed at making your UI. But this controversy rapidly expanded beyond Elden Ring, or its difficulty, or the quality of its UI. It very quickly became about hating Japanese games and Japanese game devs. Not being able to equip armor from the inventory and having to go into the equipment tab is its own level of hell. All from software games and IMO almost all Japanese games have a UI problem. Could it be a difference in usability mental model across regions? That last sentence is a woke way 
way of saying Japanese people fundamentally think differently from us. And he doesn't want to sound like a racist, so he says it like that. This is the mother of all reasons why I just can't get myself to try most Japanese games. You can instantly recognize the style and it puts me off. Dark Souls revolutionized games in the sense that instead of a story, now you can just have some guy with a big sword named Myrmidon of Loss who gasps, Xandabart, forgive me, when he dies and then 20 YouTubers will make an hour-long video about how deep your lore is. And this anti-Japanese thing, it's not a new sentiment. Here's Phil Fish in 2015 saying the same damn thing. What do you think about the recently Japanese game? Is it what is about Japanese games that inspired us? Recent. Recent. Oh, uh, recent. I'm sorry. I suck. I'm, I'm sorry. Like, you guys need to get with the times and uh, make better interfaces and, like, update your technology. Uh, we're totally kicking your ass. Back then, you guys were the king of the world, but the time has passed. Hey Phil, what have you done since Fez? You know that game that won Indie Game of the Year twice in two different years? Completely against the rules of the contest. And the second time it happened, it was because the judges were also investors in your company? And then when I made a video exposing it back in 2014, you sent me a cease and desist letter? Yeah, that video is still up. Fuck you. You're a has-been. But frankly, this all just seems like anger that Western devs don't get the same love as Japanese devs. Except they do. There's many Western games with cult followings. There's many Western games with blowout sales. Ghost of Tsushima is literally the inverse of Dark Souls, a Japanese game by a Western dev instead of a Western game by a Japanese dev, and for all of its faults, it's loved. Hollow Knight, one of my personal favorites, does the Dark Souls fallen world full of environmental storytelling thing better than Dark Souls does, and it's made by a Western indie studio. The issue isn't Japanese versus Western. The issue is letting your game's setting, the environment, the style, breathe a little bit, rather than just doing this. So, how do we get here? Why is there such a drastic divide between these big name developers and the people who they make games for? Well, part of the reason I went over already in my G4 Frost Kieran video. These people don't like gamers because gamers are, frankly, very different from them. Gamers are edgier, they enjoy edgier humor. Game advertisements from the 90s and 2000s had no problem embracing that aspect of gaming culture, for example. Downstream from this, gamers are very anti-censorship. They didn't tolerate Jack Thompson censoring their games from the right, and they don't like these woke scolds censoring them from the left now. The fact that things that were considered perfectly fine when I was a kid are now being censored by a new generation of Puritans is a hint that we might be regressing as a society. But more importantly is that gamers are competitive, and competition flies directly in the face of the everybody is equal, everybody gets a participation trophy, everybody is safe, nobody is challenged mentality of the broader left right now. And yes, I'm not talking about liberals, I'm talking about progressives who coddle and socialists who equalize. The number of stories that people post on social media about how they were a young impressionable gamer once, and they were once part of the alt-right because of video games, and now they see their younger siblings or cousins playing games and smack-talking in League of Legends and getting too competitive to ever become leftoids, has to be in the millions. Every time one of these stories is put out there, usually in like a 30 tweet thread, it gets tons of shares and likes from people who just want their biases confirmed, that gamerism and leftism are mutually exclusive, and that's that. And you know what? I've been thinking about this for a little bit, and on some level that actually might be correct. It's true that a healthy competitive spirit and socialism are at odds with one another, on some fundamental level, but it's more than that. Here's an article from 2018, How Video Games Are Fueling the Rise of the Far Right. It's obviously a ridiculous title, but I'm coming around to the idea that video games absolutely fuel anti-leftism. Not necessarily pro-rightism, just anti-leftism. This guy, of course, links Trump and 4chan and Gamergate and gamers together, claiming that gamers and gamer culture recruits for the right. But I do think that these things recruit for the not-left. And the not-left isn't just the right, it's also the center and the politically unaligned. These spaces are places that allow edgy humor, while the left is very padded corners about comedy. They foster competition, while the left favors equality. And really gaming, actually playing a game at a high level of skill, generally favors an intuitional mindset, while the left routinely ignores intuition and instead relies on pure reason. Right-wing ideologies have been overrepresented and dominant throughout the history of video games. Although affected by context, video games have long focused on the expulsion of aliens, space invaders to XCOM, fear of impure infection, half-life to the last of us, border control, missile commander to plants versus zombies, territory acquisition, command and conquer to splatoon, empire building, civilization to tropica, princess recovery, mario to zelda, and the restoration of natural harmony, sonic to farmville. The issue is, this person is describing positive things about the right. These are virtues. Rescuing a person in distress, even if she's a girl, is good. Border control and expulsion of invaders is good. Restoration of natural harmony is good. In fact, the left even agrees this stuff is good, from environmental activists to native rights movements. Video games 
put the user to work on an instinctual level, making the gamer feel impulsive agreement with these ideologies. Playing Resident Evil is not equivalent to watching the movie, because the controller-wielding gamer experiences the desires of the game as their own desires, not as the desires of another. The psychoanalyst Jacques Lacan distinguished between drives and instincts. While instincts come from within us, drives occur when political forces propel us in certain directions. In these terms, video games are drives masquerading as instincts, naturalizing right-wing ideologies in a way that other media can't by offering its users the chance to experience them on a personal level. This is actually, postmodernism aside, a true passage. This person is describing a whole section of the human condition that the left has abandoned. What's actually going on here is that video games are showing why these instincts, not drives, fuck Lacan, have some merit. They're letting players experience things in a simulated first-hand way, so that they may better understand those things on a deeper level, rather than simply being told what to think. Again, it's intuitively knowing something through experience, rather than rationalistically reading the theory of that thing. And we know this is true. That's what game feel is. The idea that your mind and the controller kind of merge when you're playing a game, and moving the character on the screen becomes as natural as walking around. That's game feel. That's a component of game feel. And it's an intuitional process, not a rational one. And on some level, we know that this is all true because we have a very public example of a game that goes against intuition, and that is The Last of Us 2. The game tries very, very hard to put forward this both sides are equal, revenge is bad story. But nobody bought it. Everybody liked Ellie because Ellie was a part of the first game. She was what made the first game, in fact, her relationship with Joel. Nobody wanted to cheer for Abby. Nobody cared about Abby's side of the story. But the game forced that on the player. And anybody who actually played that game and isn't just an establishment shill will tell you in different words, but they'll mean the same thing, that playing as Abby and doing things against Ellie's interest felt counter to their intuition. In general, this article is actually kind of correct, but where the author writes things as negatives, I think they're actually positives. It's not that gaming is explicitly right-leaning, it's just explicitly not left-leaning, and that there's more to politics than just right and left. The effect he's appealing to here does exist. That doesn't mean that gaming is a pipeline to white nationalism or whatever. It simply means that gamers are generally more immunized than your average person against socialist subversion. So that explains the gamer side of the gamer-developer divide. But what about the developer side? How'd we get here? Well, just look at the state of game dev. There's sexual assault allegations out the wazoo, constant crunch and layoffs, attempts to unionize that either go bust or massively harm the company they're working for. The industry's got institutional problems, at least insofar as AAA is concerned. Way more to cover in this video. But it's not just that. Look at the people inside these institutions. Look at how they treat what they've inherited. Let me give you a rapid fire of a bunch of shit, because there's just too much of it to go over. Ubisoft's controversy about Assassin's Creed Odyssey in 2019. Woke scolds complained that the player was forced into a heterosexual relationship, which made sense in the lore of the game, because the past in Assassin's Creed, in this case Ancient Greece, is a simulation by the Animus machine, created by reading the DNA of a presently alive person, which contains the genetic memory of their ancestors. If the character in Odyssey was gay, they wouldn't have reproduced, and their genetic memory wouldn't exist today. Lore just doesn't matter though nowadays, and Ubisoft added gay relationships in a DLC, with probably the dumbest of the woke scolds saying this is an important first step towards mitigating the damage. The damage of a video game? The damage to their stocks, more like it. Dead or Alive advertisement running on an Evo stream, also in 2019. Dead or Alive 6 features female characters who were attractive, which woke scolds found to be problematic. The ad itself contained two attractive Japanese women, making jokes about jiggle physics in video games, pointing to their own boobs. Evo apologized and ended the stream early to, quote, protect the integrity of their brand. After the failure of Mass Effect Andromeda, the developers left EA to form their own indie studio, also in 2019. It's called Brass Lion Entertainment, and it's focused on creating original fictional universes that center on black, brown, and other marginalized characters, cultures, and stories. Despite being funded and three years of development time, nothing has come out of Brass Lion Entertainment yet. Their website lists one unannounced action RPG and one other project called Corner Wolves, which was due to launch in 2021 as a narrative fictional podcast. Not a game, but a podcast. Well, it's 2021 on their website, but it's 2020 on their Twitter. It's still not out yet though. THQ Nordic hosted an AMA on 8chan at one point. The GM of Microsoft Studios took the opportunity to publicly pressure THQ Nordic on Twitter. A developer at DICE over on Reset Era instigated the brigading of that community towards THQ Nordic. Major video game publishers use social media to get their followers to perform witch hunts against their competitors. Diadolic Entertainment, the creator of the Deponia series, posted this with the hashtag Refugees Welcome. What the shit is this? This is like a 10 year old simultaneously making EU migrant propaganda and foot fetish pictures.
Mortal Kombat, a game series known for its ridiculous, over-the-top amounts of violence, saw the female characters in its latest entry, Mortal Kombat 11, purposefully desexualized for woke reasons, despite all of the, you know, obvious violence. Complaints on their Steam page and forums were immediately cracked down on. Rivet, from the new Ratchet and Clank game, is apparently problematic because she has the tiniest bit of a feminine-looking figure, even though it's a fucking space rat furry whatever, and the person who modeled her character has no problem telling you about how the voices of trans people were ignored by higher-ups when the game was being created. Even though, look at her, there's nothing wrong with this. In fact, people thought Rivet was trans before the game came out. The issue is, the institution of game development is full of progressives. People who cry over every little fucking thing, who take every moment to point out the tiniest of microaggressions, and who absolutely hate the people who pay their bills, whether that's their bosses or their customers. The current Elden Ring thing is just the latest in a long tradition of game devs who don't know how to make a good game, getting pissy because the market has spoken and told them that people like something other than what they make. Maybe that's why they want to abolish the market so fucking badly. But the truth is, they just suck. There's no big deep mystery behind it. The stuff they make is hot garbage, and they can't compete. So they're going to use their platform to complain that people like other products more than what they're making. Remember that big shitstorm over Steam's unparalleled market share, and how Randy Pitchfork made a big public virtue signal about Borderlands being a one-year epic game store exclusive because he wanted Steam to be taken down a peg or two? Well, the reason Steam got there in the first place is because it just does everything that people want it to do. No bullshit, no fuss, and really, only a few problems. Steam's competitors suck. They ban people for the wrong opinions on or off platform, they support awful business practices, they implement bad business practices themselves, and prog support them not because they want to demonopolize Steam, but because they envision themselves as wielding that power in their favor. And this Elden Ring situation is just like that. Elden Ring does what gamers want it to do. It's popular. It's the big thing on social media right now. And the game devs who view their job as not creating fun or interesting games, but instead as directing the flow of culture, are livid that they're being rerouted around. Elden Ring is a game that explicitly does not hold your hand. It's punishing. It requires something of you to play it. Not a lot, just that you familiarize yourself with its rules. It won't tell you where to go or what to do. It will ask you to engage your brain and figure it out the way that older games once did. And it will also demand that you learn its combat rather than simply mashing the A button to win. It's not toxic gamer culture that you have to play by its rules. It's called getting good. And getting good is part of the fun. Ultimately, it's just a good dose of escapism. Progs cry about how everything's political. There's no neutral consumption. There's no escapism. But frankly, that just means that they're the thing that people need to escape from in the first place. Alright guys, that's about it for me. Hope you enjoyed the video. Yes, trucker video's still coming. It's a big one. I'm working on it. Don't worry. I'm streaming tonight on the gaming channel. That's Game Boomers. You'll find us on Twitch and YouTube. And you know what? We're playing Elden Ring. I'll see you there, guys. I love you.